Well, hey, everybody, thanks for coming back to the CEO for Life Experience. And I have a super guest with us today, um, someone I got a chance to meet in the last week. And um, I talk a lot about light in our episodes. And um, when I met Mandy, uh, the room got a little bit brighter because of her heart. And I'm super excited to have her here today. So Mandy Morris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Robert. I'm, I'm just so thrilled to be here. I appreciate it. Super, super. So well, listen, um, so as we go through these episodes, we're always very real. We like to talk about the CEO for life concept of what it takes to be the CEO for life. We're all born with the first job, which is being our CEO. So maybe talk a little bit about the context of, you know, Mandy Morris, where you're at, what you do, what the world calls you in terms of work. Um, mm -hmm. Give us some context around that. Yeah, awesome. So I'm a mental health therapist. I've been a licensed professional counselor for over 10 years now. Um, and I'm also a certified EMDR clinician, which is essentially a, a trauma therapy, a trauma treatment um, that I'm very passionate about as well. Um, and I also do a lot of corporate psychology, helping leaders break out of themselves <laughs> that um, keeps them sort of in a you know, armored up is the best way to say it uh, in a way that they don't even realize that they're creating a toxic culture sometimes. And so um, that's that's more of a passion project that I have around that because I really am a firm believer that if our leaders can be emotionally and mentally well, like how much more productive and creative would our world be to have people mm -hmm. like that? Um, my heart and what I do is, I just love seeing people become free. Um, from a personal standpoint, I know how it feels to kind of be trapped in your own prison and how much that just, it keeps you from being able to see who you really are, to be able to see what you're really meant to do, how you were created, how you're wired. Um, and so breaking out of, you know, these, these prisons that, that we have in our mind and our body from our past experiences, from trauma, from negative beliefs we have about ourselves, um, seeing someone really get who they are and have that, that moment of, I'm just so ready to start being me. <laughs> um, it's just, it's just the best thing in the world. And so, um, yeah, that's a short version of what I do and why I like what I do. So share with us a little bit more because in the in the, in the in the concept around CEO for life, we start with this whole understanding of self-aware, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where everything mm -hmm. starts. You have to have some some level of self-awareness. So how did you know that you were this giving person? Have you always been that way? Have you gone through things in your life that have caused you to really say, this is where I want to go and who I am now? Or maybe share with us about how did you come to your self-awareness to follow your vision and where you're at? Yeah. So I've I've always been a very caring person. Um, I always, <laughs> I joke with my clients, I always say I'm a, I'm still a people pleaser in recovery. Like that's me. I just, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love people. And sometimes, you know, it's like, it's like my superpower, but it's also my kryptonite sometimes, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I can lose sight of my own self at times, but, um, you know, growing up, I was a big time athlete. Sports were everything. I was a basketball player, volleyball player, um, you know, going to college and, and trying to be on sports teams was really important to me. And so I actually had started off being an athletic trainer, going to college for that. Um, and, uh, and throughout my high school life, like I, I even remember, um, I had a really, I went to a really small private high school. There was like maybe a hundred in my graduating class. And so we all got senior superlatives and, and everyone, I was like, oh, maybe I'll get like most athletic or I'll get like, you know, what, whatever. And I was so pissed that I got most caring. <laughs> I was like, that's not a real superlative. That's not real at all. Like they just give that everyone cares, you know? And, and yeah, so, I mean, it's like always been in me. So yeah, so flash forward to, um, to college and I just, I honestly, I don't remember why I started doing this, but I had started volunteering at this like crisis center for women that they had there. And I just fell in love with it. I, 
you know, I was called a lay counselor. So they knew that I like wasn't actually trained, but I could just be there to support these women who were in some sort of crisis and we'd get them resources and all that to the point where I was wanting to skip class. And I'm not a rule breaker. Like I like to follow the rules and I like to you know know what my lane is. Recovering and... people pleaser. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. Um, and, and so I was like, man, maybe I need to rethink things. So mm -hmm. at the time, I was also in my own therapy and mm -hmm. I was seeing my counselor. I was having a hard time adjusting to life in college, feeling very depressed and alone. Also, um, my oldest brother, he had just um, about the year before it really the shit hit the fan where he um, we found out that he was an alcoholic and there was a lot of things that were really hard on the family around that. And so, um, you know, I really appreciated my therapist and was so all that together, I was like, maybe I should switch my major. And I was right. dating someone at the time who was a psychology major. And then like, here's a little, you can analyze my brain on this. I was like, I don't want to switch and let, and then people are going to think that I'm just switching because of him. And so maybe I won't. And I like put it off and put it off. And then I was like, you know what? I, I just, I need to take that risk. And I think it was like one of the first times in my life, I really stood up for myself and went against what other people thought I should do and did something that I wanted to do. I remember mm -hmm. having the conversation with my parents of um, that I wanted to do this and, and I love my parents and we have a great relationship, um, but they were very skeptical. It, they, I mean, they didn't say it like this um, and, and we've talked about this since then, but they essentially sent the message that, are you really well enough to help people? And, wow. Yeah, and smokes. right, right, and um, and I just I didn't know, and but I was gonna do it anyway, and because that I felt like that was my heart, right. and so I switched majors. Um, I uh, you know got into a master's program shortly after college. Um, the guy I had been dating, we ended up getting married, and that. And I bring that piece up because um, my journey through the seven years that I was married is what pretty much what has become my own mission and, and ministry and who I am now. Um, and I, my coworker um, who started Mosaic Counseling Group with me, um, her and I have a saying whenever we go through like really hard things in life and personal stuff and because we've, we've done life together, we've been through traumas together um, to, to kind of relieve the, the seriousness of all of this. We, we have this saying that's like, I'm just so tired of becoming a better therapist. Like I hate it <laughs> because these experiences have made us become better at what we do, um, which I would yep. never want them to happen, but they have. Yep. Um, so I was, my marriage began to fall apart pretty much um, quickly, I would say six months to a year after we had gotten married. I had already been with him for three years. So there was definitely significant bond and attachment there. Right. And um, the long story short is he ended up being diagnosed with a narcissistic personality disorder. And mm -hmm. for um, anyone who knows anything about that, um, it's it's the, the amount of emotional and psychological abuse and tactics that go along with that sort of personality um, is really incredible in a very bad way. Um, and it took me, it took a lot of strategizing for me to be able to leave and get out of that situation. Um, and it, I remember being so depressed and so anxious and um, not knowing what to do. I was, I was super quiet about things for a long time because you don't get divorced, especially I grew up in a very Christian home that with with a lot of expectations and right. you just you don't do that right. um, and so for me I would you know our brain can't hold two conflicting beliefs and so mm -hmm. I would rationalize the things that weren't okay to make them okay right. Got it. and yeah and so and then I, I, it got to a point where um, you know he I mean he would one of the things he would do is he would threatened to, to hurt himself or to kill himself if I left and things like that. And, and, and it, it got to a point that I was just so scared 
that I, I had to let someone know. And I, I called my oldest brother um, and like within an hour he was at my house and he was telling him that he needed to go get help. And, um, and that, that was the beginning of the end, which probably took about another year later for it to actually end and, and there be no contact and me separate and all of that. But my experience in recovering from um, narcissistic abuse uh, has, has been hard. And, sure. and so I, I felt so small in my relationship. I felt you know, with the narcissist, they, they're the one who know they, they're right. You're wrong. Um, they kind of, they make you feel like you're the crazy one. So I, I was used to always doubting myself and used to always questioning myself, um, which coupled that with a, with a people pleaser that I naturally am, that was like a disaster for my self-esteem, you know? And, sure. um, and so really healing and breaking out of that and reconnecting to who I am as a person, um, and even taking some of these more uh, challenging steps where I'm forcing myself to grow even more has been really healing for me. Um, mm -hmm. Like two years ago, I started, um, I, I had all, I've had all these ideas in my mind of things I wanna do to help people. I, I go on my runs in the morning. It's like run time is when I do my podcast, when I do church, when I like, I get my ideas and, and I'm running, I'm getting all these ideas. I come back home, I write them down. Now I have a book full of ideas I've done nothing with, right? And so right. I was like thinking about it and I, I knew I needed to get a social media presence. So about two, two and a half years ago, I started doing different mental health pages online that are strictly mental health related, started getting a following. From there, now I'm I'm getting some more speaking gigs. I've, I meet some cool people. Um, uh, rapper singer songwriter Adila who now her and I are doing mental health in the music industry stuff and you know then I get a, a call from Chris Lavoie that's do you want to be on four days to save the world show and 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 I just try to keep showing up and it's like for me I might because my heart has always been I want to help I don't want to just help people on an individual level but I really want to reach the masses and, but I need, I need platforms to do that. Um, and so I just see how those opportunities have been provided by me breaking out of my own toxic environments and, and me doing my own therapy and, you know, getting the help that I need so that I can really be who I feel like I'm created to be. Yeah. Okay. So everyone listening, everybody watching deep breath, Take in everything that you just heard from Andy because it's super powerful. There's a lot of great stuff here to talk about because everything I just heard is a lot of what we talk about in the CEO for Life experience in the podcast. And so let's begin to unpack some of this. Okay. Ready? Ready. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk about that struck me was um, you, you mentioned that you had a vision, you had a passion for what you wanted to do. It was different than, than what other people thought you should do. And in the book, we talk about shareholders, right? CEOs have shareholders, investors, equity partners, whatever else. But in life, we have life partners. We have people that love us and we're, we, we often do things that they may not agree with. So how, how, did, what's your guidance on and coach us a little bit? How do, how do I go about approaching the people that love me that don't necessarily agree with what I want to do, but I want to do it. Yeah. What's your advice? Oh, that's a great question. So I would say first and foremost, it's if these are the people who you know love you, like not in spite of your imperfections, but because of them, that looking at what they're saying, like looking behind what they're saying for what they really mean. What I mean by that is, is they're trying to be protective. They're trying to be helpful. That's not their you typically that's not their intention is not to bring you down they're they're like trying to you know think ahead for you so that you don't get hurt right. and so if you can speak that up front like i i know you love me and you want what's best for me and my heart is that i'm going to take this risk and do that do this so how you can support me is by being encouraging by 
by shutting up, by, you know, by whatever it is that you need them to do, but it's right. not getting defensive at what they're saying. People are operating out their own baggage, their own stuff. And if they're really there to support and love you, sometimes they just need direction on what that looks like. And you need to see past their words and what they're saying and assume the best in them so that they can even hear what you're trying to say to them. Yeah, that's super important. I think you're right. It's because quite often we turn very defensive. Um, that's me, right? I go, yeah. I go into defense mode. If someone is giving me something counter to what I'm trying to achieve, I become very defensive instead of, like you said, maybe digging a little deeper and looking past of their reasoning and their why. Yeah. Yeah. And being very clear about what you need and what you want and what support looks like. Being clear is kind, even if that means saying difficult things, like if they're doing things that are hurtful, it's being willing to have right. those vulnerable conversations. You know, by by not being vulnerable and being honest, you're doing them a disservice and yourself. And so yeah. clear being clear can be really hard. Being vulnerable always feels risky. I mean, there's emotional exposure there. There's uncertainty, but it's always the kind thing to do. It's great advice. It's great advice. Um, Talk about, you know, I, this is something that hasn't come up in, in our, in any of the podcasts I've had so far. And I love, I love this idea of the recovering people pleaser because <laughs> it's, it's, they're contradictory as, as you outlaid. And so I want to dig into that a little bit more because it's a good thing to want to, to please, but at the same time, at what point do you guide and do you offer from your experience? When does it become not good? Yeah. And how, how should people look at that or have some triggers or antenna up for those kind of things if that's who they are? Right, right. So as human beings, we, we all have needs. We have our own personal set of feelings about things, our own thoughts about things. Each person is unique. Robert, there's no one in the world that is you and you can't be anyone else. And so mm -hmm. with that in mind, you have to, it's important to stay connected to yourself. A lot of times people please are way too connected to others. And not and that doesn't that doesn't sound like it's a bad thing because we're, we're wired for connection. It, literally it's in our neurobiology that we are wired for connection. But when we're too outward focused, we can lose sen a sense of ourself. And so how do we know if we're doing this, right? So cuz like I love helping people. I I almost feel selfish sometimes helping people because I feel so good about myself afterwards, you know, and so like there's a payoff there for it. Yeah. 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 No, I right. Yeah. 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 So in, in my own work around my people pleasing in recovery and work I do with my clients is a good way to know if you're in the unhealthy part of that is if you start to feel resentment. So I will start to feel resentment towards wishing that I had said something but didn't, wishing that my feelings were a little more important and out there maybe, wishing that, man, I wish, I wish I was just as important as I make that person be important. And now like now there's resentment building maybe, or it could be even in a, in a coworker, you know, work environment type of thing where um, I didn't speak up about something and I, now I'm like kind of resentful that that person's running the show, you know, and not me or, you know, whatever it may be. And so those little twinges, uh, one of the sayings that I have that's really cheesy, but I love it. So whatever is pay attention to the tension. Your body is going to pick up on things way before it makes it to your brain. Yep. And so when you can begin to be very connected to the physical sensations in your body around things that's trying to guide you and and just being able to learn to live in the pause of that because as people pleasers we quickly dismiss our automatic feelings but our automatic feelings and signals that go off play a big part in letting us know what we need and so I think those are just some key things to begin to create self-awareness around if you're getting into an unhealthy place around people pleasing. Yeah, it's I think some key things for my takeaway for that, Mandy, is that, you know, sometimes you gotta 
um, I, I'm, I'm really big on this right now is like living in the shh. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Right. And so in that, you know, I had someone you know, just tell me, tell me to shh, right? So and that's what we had this whole discussion, but living in the shh, because in the shh, like you said, you can begin to understand that tension because I know I've run into it. I've run into it. So, and I, and I have not paid attention to it. And then I look back and I'm like, man, I knew, I knew I should have done this or done that. And, and because I could feel it. Right. It wasn't just here. Right. Yep. And oftentimes the reason us people pleasers don't want to speak up or or do that thing that man, we wish we would have done later is because we're too concerned about the other person's emotions. We're too concerned about, rocking the boat or creating some discomfort and discomfort is what's needed for growth i mean you think about growing pains you think about physically when we're growing and it hurts we're not responsible for other people's feelings we are responsible for you know treating people with love and kindness but if you're talking about a people pleaser then they already know how to do that but for myself so often i won't i'll i'll go along with the being compliant. I'll go along with, you know, what I think they need or what would be best for them because I don't want to rock the boat or I don't want to make them feel bad. And then later on, maybe the next day or the next night, I'm like, oh, I mean, I feel good that they they feel good, but what about me, you know? And and so there's this, this you know, dichotomy around it and it's hard. Yeah, that push and pull and that, like you said, the the, the the pay attention to the attention. I think that's such a key takeaway. So anyone that's listening or watching this, you know, take a moment, go back and listen to what Mandy just taught us, which was, you know, pay attention to the attention. Um, I guarantee someone is dealing with that right now or has experienced that and what a good learning and a skill to put into place to pay attention to the attention. I love that. That's yeah. really, really solid. That's so good. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, so let's, let's dive a little bit deeper in our last, our, our little bit of time here, because I think this is an important thing is, you know, what you described in your life that you, that you, that was a part of your life and the color of, of who, who you are, um, that could easily take you a couple different ways. And one of the things that, um, that I took away from the show that we were just working on the four days to save the world is the, the people that were on the show, they all had these experiences, but they didn't let it turn negative into them. Right. Yeah. Somehow they found a positive in it. Yeah. And I, that's just, it was so powerful for me. And so maybe you can share a little bit about what you've learned about not allowing to make the negative to take over. Mm, yeah. That's so important. Yeah. And, and it's important and it's complicated because right. if you ask me when I was in it, I would say there is no positive. If I'm being completely honest, when I was yeah. in the darkest parts of that season of my life, that seven year season of my life, mm-hmm. I, I didn't think there was a way out. Mm-hmm. And, and I couldn't be grateful and I couldn't, you know, do all these positive things. But what I, what I know I had to do was to survive it. And I knew I, this was bigger than me. And so I knew I I needed support and help. And, and I knew that I had my faith. And so once I allowed myself to acknowledge what was wrong, because I wanted to live in denial about it for forever. Like this was the person I was supposed to be with for the rest of my life. Right. And like living in denial around it was comfortable for a while right? Because you can break and rationalize anything. (laughs) And and it's a powerful tool, you know, um, that that keeps you safe. But once I I really was able to, I mean, they say the first first step to recovery is admitting you have a problem. It is admitting that then I was able to reach out to support for support. Um, And from there, it was it was just not giving up. It was trying to get to a place of health, get to a place of making sure that my well-being was most important. You know, doing things that were in alignment with that, which was scary for me as, like I said, someone who's naturally a people pleaser because I didn't want to upset anyone. But the more I listened to my own gut, 
the more things became clear and a more alignment that happened. And from that, I started to create meaning out of what was happening to me. And that meaning that I created for myself was being able to say, it's not right now, but at some point, this is going to be the blueprint for someone else's recovery. And, and I knew I wasn't in a completely healthy place yet with it. I was still in it. I was still having nights of crying all the time, panic attacks, you know, flash, like all, all the things. Right. But, but I knew that I could create some meaning out of the dark stuff. And so I think for people who are in it, it's, it, you know, it's not necessarily that you have to be thankful or, or be super positive or anything, but it's about, it's about support and it's about creating meaning from your story because it is a part of your story. And once I was, you know, really like out of the toxic environment and all of that, and I did my own healing, then I was, then I had this passion. I was like, man, I want to help other people who've been in toxic relationships. And, and I created meaning from that. And so I think like when we were at the four days to save the world, these are a lot of people who are on the other side of their story. And so right. they have chosen to do good with it. They've made sure. a conscious choice around it. And so um, in that sense, you have to stay connected to the fact that you're not the only one who's going through something that you're going through and that if you can own it as a part of your story and not let shame creep in around it, because that's what happens is if you let shame, like, I can't believe I went through that. That's so embarrassing. That's so shameful. I should have done this. I should have done that. Then that is just going to, one, create secrecy around your story, going to make you feel more shame about yourself. And that just leads to all sorts of negativity. But when you can accept yourself so compassionately and warmly and the fact that it's okay that you're that you're struggling that you're in a hard spot but this isn't the end of it and then create right. meaning from it um that really it does something for your soul it really does you know that leads us to a really probably a good point to 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 walk through this way we could talk forever about it for this because it's it's so meaningful it's so purposeful it i mean it, it, it relates on, on so many ways don't tempt you know, me as, with talking forever about it because i, I will. know <laughs> i love it i love it and hey by the way so um i always like to remind everyone that's listening or watching is like mandy's a real person she's not an actor actress she's she's she doesn't play on a tv show she's a real person so you can contact her you can get in yeah. touch with her if any of this resonates with you please 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 reach out for her i'm going to link the information above or below on how to get in touch with her those kind of things so um let's kind of maybe wrap this up and, and just let's grab some action on this you're you're CEOs take risks mm. and doing something scary is a part of being the CEO uh, for life. Talk a little bit about how you found you're doing something scary, you mm. know, share with us a little bit around that because there's gotta be just listen to your story. There's gotta be plenty of moments, but share with us on how to do something scary. What's, what's your thoughts? Where's your advice? How, lead us, coach us. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. Well, in every next phase of my life has been preceded by being really scared. I've not gotten to the next level of anything without that fear. And, and it, it takes practice to be able to trust the fear part of it. And so um, mm -hmm. one of the things that um, I do on this uh, social uh, platform called XXO Connect, I do a mastermind class on making friends with fear. And um, in that, you know, there, there's different types of fear. There's fear because maybe there's a safety issue in your environment. There's fear because you're worrying about the future. Um, and then there's also fear that's connected to a purpose, connected to a meaning. And for me, when, when I was shaking and you know my heart's in my stomach and i'm like okay i want to leave him but it's scary i want to start my next program but am i 
am I really the expert? You know, you get that imposter syndrome going on. You know, uh, I want to do this TV show, but what if I don't show up in the way I'm, I'm, I need to be? Or, you know, and, but yet it's all still in alignment with what you imagine being freedom in your life. Mm-hmm. You imagine being that next step. And so when that happens, it's an opportunity to reframe that fear into courage. And so instead of I'm so scared is I'm going to be really brave today. In this moment, I'm going to, sh- I'm going to have courage because courage and fear, they, they have to exist together. Otherwise it wouldn't be courage, you know? Right. And so I think it's, it's knowing that and knowing that failure doesn't mean you didn't take the right step. Like getting mm. punched in the face with life, getting bruised and beat up doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It actually means you're doing it right. You know, because that's a part yeah. of the process. Yeah, exactly. And, and it, yeah. And so it's it's about your the relationship you have with fear. Fear isn't the enemy. It's actually the friend in a lot of cases. And especially when it comes to, to like leveling yourself up in your personal life, in your professional life, you know, in your career, whatever it may be, um, that that actually lets you know that you're on the right track. And from there, like, I mean, I, I kid you not, like last summer, I got to be on this, this platform um, with uh, some musicians and artists, and um, there's going to be several hundred people on there and they wanted me to come on and talk about mental health in the music industry and for me at the time it was like the biggest thing i'd ever done and i saw like some of the other panelists who were going to be there and they have like 100k followers on instagram they have like and i had at the time i had like 300 right and i'm like holy shit and i call and i like feel i feel the fear right and i call my coworker. i said talk me off the anxiety ledge i don't feel like the expert i don't know what i'm doing and, and, and I, but I had to be real with how I was feeling and, and right. got to my truth and I did it anyway. And it was great. And once I got in my element, it was fine, you know, but you have to push through that. Yeah. So, yeah. What a, what a way to, to wrap up our conversation, at least for this moment, because I have a feeling we'll be talking again on some other topics. Oh, I hope so. You know, we, yeah, no, we, we talked a whole lot. I mean, we got a really a really good idea of who Mandy is and what your vision, your passion is. But, you know, we talked about specifically of how to deal with those shareholders in our lives, which is super important. We talked about, you know, how to make sure that we're, we're good enough with ourselves, even though we're help. you know, our, our thing is to please other people. We talked about keep showing up, pay attention to the tension. We talked about even practicing being scared. That's like a huge takeaway for me. I love that actively going after practicing being scared. That's so good, Mandy. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I just got to tell you, thank you for the time. This has been so good. And like I said, just a few minutes ago, Mandy's a real person. You can connect with her, yes, follow please. her on Instagram. I'm going to put all the information for LinkedIn, Instagram, everywhere else and how to get in touch with her. Please do not let this just live in your ears and your eyes. Mm-hmm. Take what you just heard and experience with Mandy, go deeper, go further. If it touched your heart or your brain, connect with Mandy um, and, and take this further because uh, that's what this is all about. Like you said before, connecting. So that's everything. Thank you so much, Robert. And I just want to say thank you for being, having this platform as a vessel to help people because it's, it's quite powerful. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's uh, thank you. I really appreciate that. All right. We'll see y'all on the next episode of the CEO for life experience. See ya.